Greetings. Good afternoon. What better way to spend a Friday afternoon than in the company of someone who I class as a bit of a PR guru? You can guess it. This, of course, is uh, Real PR with Fiona Scott. And that's right. We've got the very person that the show is named after because it's all about her. It is Fiona Scott. Hi, Chris. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Re really excited uh, at the start of this channel and with uh, sharing loads of advice, information, tips, hints and stories with people over the coming months. It is. And I've actually got to correct myself. I've said it's all about you. That's only this show that is all about you, isn't it? And PR and everything else. So you, you allowed me that indulgence for episode one, didn't you, basically? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. We We do have some fabulous guests lined up for the rest of the year and um it would be boring if it's just me we've got to mix it up a bit and be around other people at least i have to anyway exactly right and i mean that's the idea is that i remember when i spoke to you about uh, this the whole visual pr uh, about bringing pr to life uh which you've already bitten into because you've got your podcast the audio podcast that you do on a monthly basis that's gone from strength to strength already hasn't it yeah, I started my podcast, started planning it in the middle of 2021, um, because I think planning is really important. And it launched in the December, uh, so it's been going just over two years, I do two a month, and I've had about three and a half thousand downloads already, loads of outcomes from it. And there's also the joy of being able to call yourself a podcaster, so I truly can say I'm a podcaster. But I think it was the... Um, the analysis of some of the stats that made me think that now was the time to launch a sort of dedicated YouTube channel in a consistent manner, rather than just doing it on an ad hoc basis now and then when I felt like it. Um, I know it sounds obvious, but until you do something, you don't realise how important consistency is in building your own brand and in telling your stories and the stories of those around you. Yeah, and I mean, I I heard your one of your catchphrases the other day. It's not about sales; it's about what was I forget the conclusion on that one. Yeah, it's about visibility. That's what it That's is. That's the one. It's about, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, well, uh, my BA Hannah coined the phrase Fionaism um, because <laughs> I come out with these things regularly, pithy things. Because I love words, so I play about with words, but. Anybody in business who's a service-based business or an expert in something um, will have these key phrases or sentences that they keep on repeating, almost ad nauseum for them. Um, um, so I've got a whole stack of them. Good. No, and, and that one really resonated with me. It made complete sense. And that that's what this is about. We're bringing it to life. We're bringing you to life. We're going to be bringing your guests a lot of information to be able to share tips for, you know, business owners and individuals that can benefit from PR. And I mean, to, to sort of make sure everybody's aware of, you know, where Fiona sits with this, if you didn't already. I mean, let's be honest, most people know you, Fiona, anyway. But it it's not just the do it for you, but you've been training people, not just on PR, but you mentioned, for example, podcasts. You spent the whole of yesterday, for example, training people to be able to do those podcasts. And, and that's where your passion really sits, is both doing it for people and empowering people to be able to do it. Yeah, I mean, I truly believe that every single business owner um, needs to understand what PR is and to do it. And there are loads of different elements to it because it means public relations. People tend to focus on the press relations, which is my area of speciality. But it can't just be that, Chris. You've got to be visible in lots of different ways. And that doesn't matter where you are in the world in terms of um, your business, your expertise. 
And everybody needs to know this stuff. So I try and meet them where they are in their journey, where they are in their budget. And when it comes to retain services, basically, we've got to get on. Uh, we've got to believe in each other. We've got to go on a journey together. Um, and also what people forget about PR professionals is I can't work with five accountants in my community or, yeah. um, I don't know, three graphic designers. Um, there's, a, a, there's a loss of trust there. It's not ethical to do that. So I actually have to market myself and PR myself in a much broader way than many other service-based businesses. I mean, no one says to a lawyer, um, you know, if they come and do your will at home, they, you don't say to them, well, now you've done my will in my street, you can't provide a will to anyone else in, your, in my street. But they do say it to people like me. Um, yeah. So I always have to bear that in mind. I have to bear that in mind. No, I, I and I've seen that many a time, and and I get that. That's why this is lovely. Is that um, is this is opening it up? Is that there's going to be a lot of advice is given over the episodes. They're every month, aiming towards the early part of the month uh, is is the objective going forward, uh, as much as possible. Obviously, uh, it's going to be tips, but it's going to be brought to life with the fact that we're going to have you're going to have guests from I can safely say all over the world by the sounds of it. N either that they're bringing tips or that they're bringing relevancy to the story and the tips that you're sharing. I think that's the fair way to sum it up, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I, I want to miss a mix of guests, but all of them with a sort of global view. Um, it doesn't really matter where their business is based, but I, also some journalists that either um, work overseas or work for overseas outlets or live overseas because we're, let's face it, we're all nosy about what is it, I'm nosy, what is it like to be a journalist in another country? Are there different restrictions on you? What type of stories do they write? What's their life like? Um, so this is really, um, I want my guests to have a global and world view and to share those experiences, that it is professional experiences, experiences as fellow small business owners or as journalists or as media professionals. Uh, it could be even a fellow PR um, you know, I'm not precious about things like that. We're all different. We all have different skill sets. We all bring something different to the table. So the aim is to just create variety, tips and hints, and people can take from it whatever they want to. And on that basis, by the way, everybody that's watching, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook, on YouTube or LinkedIn, is put your comments or questions in as comments to that video. I'm not sure how it works on LinkedIn. I'm pretty sure it does. But certainly on Facebook and YouTube, you can put them. And I will be able to put your comments and questions up on screen with your profile name and photo, whether it's your individual or your organizations. But ask questions. As we go through this show, if anything comes up, resonates, confuses, whatever, please do get involved. It's it's going to grow into a more and more interactive show as we develop over the uh, the coming the, over the episodes over the coming months. But today we've so we've talked about the launch of this real PR, which as well, Fiona, I love that name. That real PR it was a good play on words as well. Yeah, I loved it as well. I'd like to say it was my idea. Um, it wasn't, as you know, but <laughs> it, it fits with the podcast, which is PR, not BS. Um, and uh, it just, as soon as, sometimes when you create something, you'll, you'll hear a title for it and it's just there. It's just right from the yeah. get-go. And this was just right from the get-go. It was, yeah, because we're putting it on real. That's the beauty of it. So we've launched the real PR and how it's going to go and get excited about it and keep an eye on social media because the team will be posting who the guests are going to be in future episodes. I'm going to cover some background on Fiona, and I'm really looking forward to that part. She isn't so much, but I am. Uh, we're going to then put more effort into to PR to really understand it, especially from um, you know, a business owner's perspective, which obviously I can relate to, the benefits of working with the PR expert, uh, and just sort of touch a few bits on that, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up by preview and give you an idea of what to hopefully look forward to in the next episode. So let's step it back, Fiona. I've only ever known you in in PR. Actually, I am was always aware of your media background, but before we get to the media side. I want to briefly go into your early years. Were you always destined for media or PR roles? I was certainly always destined to be a journalist, definitely. I decided I met a journalist 
called Andrew Harvey when I was about 13 or 14 years old uh, in the Somerset town where I grew up, which is about eight miles outside of Bath. It's called Radstock. I met him and it was just one of those moments where I looked at him and I thought, that's the job I want to do. And I went home and I said to my mum that I'd met Andrew Harvey. He was doing a story. I don't even, I think it was about the closure of the railway line coming through Radstock. Um, and my mum said, you'll never do that. You're far too sensitive. It will never work out. And I believed her. And wow. I went to university and trained to be a teacher. And I was doing my postgrad in teaching secondary school. And it was during that year I thought, God, I hate this. Uh, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this. And I remembered that I wanted to be a journalist. So I used that year. I did pass my PGCE. I should say that. But I used that year to apply for every job under the sun to do with journalism, PR, anything to do with the media and media outreach. And it was a really tough year. But towards the end, I got a um, traineeship, I guess we call it an apprenticeship now, um, with a local newspaper. And on the day that I was interviewed for that, I turned up and I was one of about 300. And I nearly walked away. I thought, there's no way they're going to see me above those other 300 people for the two roles that were available. But it was the one time in my life where actually I just flew through it and I got one of the roles. And that was it. The first day, and, and it started with six months intense and very, very tough training um, down in Sussex. And the first day I started that training, I knew instantly I was exactly where I needed to be. I loved it from the beginning. Can you remember, I mean, it might be the same answer, what it was that drew it to you in the first place and what it was that you absolutely loved about it? What really hit you? I think it's just uh, it's people and the fact that I could make a living writing stories about people and meeting people and being nosy about them. Because when I look back as a kid, I lived on a street, it was a rank, we called it a rank, and it was on a hill. And you would often go and play with your friends down the hill. And I was the kid that was always looking in the window, peering <laughs> at people's houses, seeing what they were up to. I've always been nosy and curious and also easily bored, to be honest. So the greatest variety in life is people. Um, and I just love people. I'm genuinely interested in them when they're talking to me and telling me their stories. Um, I'm, I'm fully present. I enjoy listening. I take it in. It doesn't sort of skip over me. And I've always had that since I was a kid. And I've also had that thing where I would attract people. So people would start telling me their stories quite unbidden. Um, it was a joke in the family that if I sat on the bus, the nutter would come and sit next to me to chat to me, <laughs> even if I did nothing, um, even if I didn't engage with them in any way. And that has not ceased in my whole 50 blah, 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 years. <laughs> I, I love that. And just quickly before I move on with that further, Beyond That Blue Door says, hello. So welcome to the show. Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> That's um, my husband, folks. I'm just telling you. <laughs> fine, fair enough. That's that's all right that he's blowing you kisses as well. Then that's okay. Yeah, yeah, um, that's fine. That's, I'll take it. <laughs> I, and I get what you're saying because I adore, uh, as you know, I I am also a, a professional motorsports commentator, and I get to sort of stand up and present on stage and interview people with these visual PR shows. And it's because I too absolutely adore that variation. You don't quite know what's going to happen. You saw with the build up to this show, for example, I was like, nope, we're not scripting, Fiona. We'll have a list of the sort of things we want to cover, but I want it to be natural. So I get why you found it as, as an absolute buzz. So there you are. You're now a journalist. Did you then, when, when did everything start to evolve and, and grow and change to some extent? Okay, well, um, I, for some reason that I can't really explain, given that I'd had no previous media experience, nobody in the family worked in the media, I had this feeling that I would get my best ground in working in local newspapers. So I stayed there for five years, absolutely loved it. So I did weekly newspaper, then I moved to Swindon on the Swindon Advertiser. And during that time, I then started to feel that I really wanted to work in television. I did um, volunteering for hospital radio in Swindon for about two years. I ran a late night show. So I got the vibe for radio and how to work a desk and decided that radio wasn't really for me. 
I'm actually a really visual person. And I also think that video um, and TV is the most powerful medium because it hits all your senses at once. Because as a viewer, you're not only listening to the action and to the words, but you're taking in someone's body language, you're taking in their tone of voice. So you're actually learning far more about those people through that medium. So I didn't want to go into radio. And also radio at that time was so poorly paid. I've no idea if it's any better. Literally, I'd be taking 100% almost pay cut. I would have been earning, in those days, I was earning, I can't remember, in, I was earning about 16,000, 17,000 in newspapers. But the, the pay they were offering in radio then was about 7,000 a year. It was just wow. crazy poor money. Yeah, crazy poor money. Um, so I started to do work experience with um, what was then called HTV. It's now known as ITV West Country. So I would give up my very precious days off and go in and do shifts. Um, and I did that for two whole years before I got a break. Wow. Okay. So you've you've had to, again, sort of really grind it out somewhat there and just keep that dogged belief that's the polite way of saying it i think isn't it but <laughs> and you yeah, stuck with it I, I think yeah yeah i mean the thing is with um tv land is some people are lucky and they get an early break and they just fit the bill but the majority of us don't and we have to work really hard we don't tick a particular box um and we just have to show by sheer persistence and consistency that we mean it and that we want to work in that environment so during that two years, it took about a year for me to be interviewed and it was contract work. It wasn't a staff job um, to get the opportunity to be interviewed for a contract that was coming up on the news. And I did that twice and I didn't get the gig. It's quite soul destroying them because you're already giving your time for free with these people. And then they say, right, OK, we've got a six month contract coming up. We'll interview you and you don't get it. Mm. And that's a horrible feeling. But on the third time, I did, but I didn't work in news. I got the gig in what we called the current affairs department then. So it was documentary making, so it's long form program making and factual entertainment. So it wasn't the day to day news that I was used to, it was long form. And initially, when I started on that contract, which was just six months, I thought, oh, it's so slow compared to daily news. Um, and I did think for about the first six weeks, I thought, what have I done? I've taken a pay cut for a six month contract. I've left a safe job to do something that's really slow. And we, because we didn't have those daily deadlines, that daily sort of energy of having to get the deadlines out four times a day, which is what it was in newspapers then. But over those six weeks, I, I slowly realized about deeper putting projects together, working on stories at a deeper level, understanding the legal implications of TV and the legal hoops that you have to go through um and i also got over a bit of a chip on my shoulder because it was the first time i'd ever worked in an environment where most of the people in the room i think it was me and one other person who hadn't been to public school who weren't privately educated so the whole way they approached tv was very different to someone who comes from a working class background um has been to a state school um, so I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder about that. But after about six weeks, I realised a few things. One, I was as good as anyone else. I really did know my stuff and I knew how to research and that they did value me. And once I got over that, I forgot. I forgot and I just got on with it. And I was there for 13 years and I'd still be there today if I hadn't been made redundant. So it was redundancy that pushed me into becoming self-employed. Was that the one where you also had to, I'm sure it's when you and I appeared on uh, BBC Radio together, that you had to go and reapply for your own job or something crazy mm. like that. Was that the one? Yeah. yeah. What happened was that ITV nationally wanted really to pull out of regional television. Um, it operated under a licence agreement that given to, by the government, which meant it had to produce so many hours of local programming and local news but it didn't make them a shed load of money. It wasn't like X Factor or any of these formulaic programs that could be sold as formulas all over the world. It was labor intensive and for them it was costly. So they wanted to get rid of that type of programming and eventually they were allowed to do so. So we kind of knew it was coming. So 300 of us were told there were now 80 jobs and we had to pile in and apply for the jobs that we felt were suitable for my, you know, our skill set. 
And for me, that was just one job, which was the job I was already doing. So I had to reapply for my own job. There was no interview process. It was all done um, via letter and online and via email. Uh, so I wasn't interviewed. I wasn't put in front of a panel. So I reapplied for the job I was already doing and I didn't get it. Wow. Which, and, and again... That, oh, it was just horrific. It was horrific. Yeah, and and that's the that's the and that's really where I was sort of emphasising this point is that you've taken the blows over the years and it's just made you stronger and stronger, um, and still we won't bring it up. But a post that you put out yesterday that again is showing how you're having to roll with the punches, but it just builds your resolve. That's the that's the impression I get of you, Fiona, is that everything that you take is actually not taking a part of you away; it's adding a part onto you. Yeah, I, I think that. Looking back, within five months, uh, although that was a devastating time, and when I think of that day when I realised my job was gone, I was not considered good enough to continue to do the job I'd already been doing. Um, but within five months, the person who did get that job had bailed. They'd found it too difficult, and I was asked to consider going back. And within five months, I thought, no, I'm not looking back. I'm moving forward. There is a life outside of television. Yeah. And... Um, and that really surprised me because it was so devastating. I thought, well, I'll, I'll go back into the fold. But actually, I ended up being offered um, on three different occasions opportunities to go back full time into TV, and I turned them all down. Um, really? And it has made, yeah, it has made me very resilient. Uh, the one thing I've learned about being a small business owner is that you've got to be flexible. You've got to keep ahead of the curve, and you've got to be able to roll with the punches because they will, they will come. For all of us, in any given year, there'll be one or two things that knock you sideways. And you've got to try your best to focus on the 300 things that were actually really brilliant mm. and learn from the things that knock you sideways. So, you know, um, success to me uh, when I started out was survival. And success to me when I started out was to recreate the salary I had when I was a series producer, which was around 40 grand a year then. And if I thought if I could recre recreate that as a freelancer, then um, yeah, I'll be happy because I'll mm. be I'll be recreating a life to my own agenda, earning what I did when I was in that role, which was a kind of middle management role. So um, yeah, and I do remember a moment when I realised I was resilient. It wasn't anything to do with work. One of my daughter Sammy, who's now twenty four was asked at school to write an essay on someone she admired. She told me about this at home. And I thought, oh, I assumed it would be some celebrity icon. I said, oh, who did you write about? And she said, oh, I wrote about you, mum. And I was like, even now I feel choked talking about it. And, she, and the one thing she wrote, I, I read it. It's really weird to read about yourself through your child's eyes. Um, and she wrote, the thing I've learned most from my mum is that every time she's failed, she's got back up and started again. And I thought, my job is done. If yes. she thinks that, my job is done. Because if that is what I'm teaching her, because none of us can protect our children from the horrible things that happen in life. But if I've taught her that, or that's what she's absorbed from me, and I didn't even know it, then my job is done. Agreed. And I love that, that we could feel the emotion there in with you. Equally, by oh, the way, I do let, let everybody know is that equally at other times when Fiona might sound like that, bless her, she might be on the verge of coughing. So bear with yeah, us. and. Uh, and yeah. Just let us know if you need to. I'll 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 cover if you need to do that. It's not a problem. Incidentally, oh, by the way, you. keep the likes and everything because we've had a like from James Hilton Fitness has liked this show. So welcome, James. Thank you, James. Uh, so, Thank you, James. Yeah, do it. Like it, love it, whatever you want to do. Uh, share it as well, please, so we get more and more people on it. Uh, and as you saw earlier, that put a comment or a question, and we'll be able to put it up on screen as well. Um, okay, so the television went. Where did you go from there then? Um, well, the one good thing that came from that, and I, you know, one positive thing I can say from ITV as a whole is that they gave us almost like six months notice um, because they wanted to make everybody across the country. I was one of a thousand people made redundant. So they wanted to, us to all to be made redundant at the same time. So uh, I had six months of full-time salary. So I thought, right, okay, I'll get myself trained on stuff. So I went on various courses to use different cameras and to use editing software. 
what I never anticipated was I'm actually didn't realize at the time that I'm a businesswoman. What I should have done was gone on courses to about how to run a business, but I didn't <laughs> do that. I did lots of other things. So um, when I came out, I thought, well, okay, I'll set some modest goals. I'll become a freelance journalist. Uh, my son was only one at the time. So I was trying to work three days a week. I had a childminder three days a week. Um, so I knew whatever I was going to build, it was going to be slowly because I could only work part time. So my boy was only young. Um, and so I set myself little goals. And one thing I did do really well, and this comes from being a journalist, was I went to every networking thing I possibly could in the Swindon and Wiltshire area. Um, because I knew that networking and being around people was going to be key to me getting my first client getting my fifth client, get my 10th client. And I needed to be out there and be seen and people needed to learn what I do, even when I hadn't properly learned what I could offer them. And um, that was one of the most successful things I did. And I didn't have a lot of money to splurge. I wasn't earning anything. So um, what I did was I went to as many of the freebie sessions as I could for a whole year. And then after that year, I thought, right, now I need to commit to one. Sadly, though, I committed to the wrong one. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> yeah. We won't yeah. name any names. Don't name any names. <laughs> no, we won't name any names. I'm not, I don't even think that group exists anymore. But I did enough but, uh, and a variety and made so many connections that it did have huge value. And and you're still a huge advocate of the networking, I know, because we uh, we, we sort of cross paths at quite a few of those as well. And it's just such a great way to do it for many reasons, isn't it? Not just for promoting your own business, but the... I mean, you said, for example, the business knowledge. Did you gain any of that from the people you were rubbing shoulders with as well then in those networking? Because I find that. I gained, yeah, I gained all of it. I gained all of it because I I didn't understand the art of doing business. I wasn't entrepreneurial. I had no one in my family ran a business. Um, my therefore i was so naive so i relied on being able to spot people that were more successful than me doing the type of business that i wanted to do or service-based business and learning from them and i soaked up every piece of advice i could um uh, later on i became more discerning about that advice but there were there wasn't courses in those days chris 15 years ago there weren't courses that i was aware of that you could go on as a startup um I didn't know if there was free advice available. I didn't know what um, government money was available for these things. The resources simply didn't appear to be there. Or if they were there, I certainly couldn't find them. And journalists are pretty plugged into a community. So I'm pretty sure that at that time there was very little available. I mean, these days, there's lots of things available for startups. If you just scratch under the surface, and I'm really glad about that, um, because I think that if I'd had that, I'd have probably had more success a lot earlier than I actually did. Yeah, and I mean, you these things happen for a reason, don't they? You might not have networked quite as much and, and all the benefits that that brought with it as well. When that business was happening then, what was the name of the business and what were you actually offering at that point? I, I'm trying to get an idea of the evolution of the business from there on, yeah, yeah. if you will. Well, initially, um, I thought of myself in two categories, if you like. There was me as a freelance journalist uh, with the ability to take contracts in TV part time if they came up. So I treated that as one part of my life. And then the other part of my life was a fledgling PR business, which I originally called Mellow Media. And I called it Mellow Media. That was the name I've chosen because uh, for that, I had a business partner when I started off. And she was based in Bristol. She had similar goals and aims to me. She'd taken time off to have her children um, and wanted to get back into the work sphere. And it felt very safe to do it with somebody else. Um, it took me a long time to work out that that was probably wasn't the best route for me. But nevertheless, that's what I did. And so what happened sort of in year one was we got one or two little gigs. I think the PR business probably turned over 10 grand a year in year one. But on the other side of it, I was picking up some journalistic work, some editing work. Um, 
little TV gigs were coming in a few days here and there. And that kept me going. And I did hit my goal. My goal was to earn in my first year of self-employment was to earn 20 grand a year if I could to get me towards my goal. And I did achieve that. And I was very proud of that. But I did it by having a portfolio career, which I kind of still have today. It's just that the PR side has grown so much. It's more like 85% of what I do instead of 5% of what I do. Yes. And that and that's because obviously, as I said at the outset, is that I've known you since that was already everything you did and, and what have you. So... Mm. It, because I want to move on to, you know, what is PR and all of those kind of things. But just to finish off on this story and fill in any gaps that I haven't asked you to to share that I may have, have forgotten. But how has that evolved over the years to what we have now with you? OK, so I was with Mellow Media for about four years and I began to realise it wasn't working out with my business partner. It wasn't her fault. We were both pretty naive, to be honest. And I began to identify that the work we were getting in was all coming from me. And she wasn't bringing in any work. She wasn't putting any of the donkey work. And I was working in TV, so I was exhausted. So um, uh, it came to a head when we got a, a, quite a good gig making a video for a big organisation in Wiltshire. And she did most of the work because I was off working in TV. And we delivered the project and it went very, very well. And at the end of it, she said, I don't want to do any of the PR stuff now. I just want to do those big projects. And, and that brought things to a head because I thought you can't cherry pick the work when you're not bringing the work in and leaving me to pick up the rest. So we had a part in other ways. Um, we both agreed it was the best thing to do. And so I kind of had to pivot really quickly then. Um, not a word pivot I would have used at the time, but one that now since lockdown <laughs> we use. Um, <laughs> so I created a blog uh, called Mums in Media, started blogging in my own voice, uh, decided I would make a conscious decision not to accept as much um, journalistic work. I would do some, but I would drop a couple of things, which I did. And it was then I started to really realise I was all right at business and I could grow clients. And uh, it really took off then. So after about two years, I thought Mums in Media doesn't work anymore. It's a bit too, hmm, I don't know really how to describe it. I was putting off a lot of people. It, I was keeping myself small using that um, term. So I then became Fiona Scott Media Consultancy. And within a year of that, my accountant was saying, you need to be that registered. So that was a whole different ball game. And that worked from 2013 until about 2020 when lockdown came. And then I was doing a lot of video work and animation. And I realized that the PR elements I was offering were broader than they'd been in the past. Because I would say to a client, OK, we're doing this, but actually we could do this and that as well. Do you want to do that? And they were saying yes. So I was producing that for them. So I thought I need to be more Scott Media. And also I was busier because I needed freelance help because I didn't want to employ other people particularly. But I was never going to get much beyond that threshold or a six-figure turnover. I've only got the same hours in the day as everybody else. Um, so the only way I could do it was by using and outsourcing and using more freelancers. So suddenly it wasn't just Fiona Scott. It really was a team of people, even if they were in the background. So I started not noticing that I was starting to talk about we as a team instead of just I and me. Um, so it became obvious that I needed to flex and change and the brand needed to reflect where I actually was. And so Scott Media came about in 2020 during lockdown because I also thought that was a great time to introduce a new brand. It would have time to bed in and to bring in a new website, which would have poor domain authority because I'd abandoned my previous website. Um, so I did use that time during lockdown to try and evolve into what you see today and it's amazing that story i'm going to move on to the pr in in more detail now um but it's amazing listening okay. to that story and i love for people that are watching uh i didn't know anything about mellow media i didn't know about mums in media either i'm loving finding out this stuff it's so cool but hearing you say about that lockdown and it made you flex and change to what you are now 
that's happened a lot, hasn't it? And I mean, you know, visual yeah. PR is a prime example is that I suddenly got thrust with my commentary work to doing these online shows to keep people together and suddenly went, hang on a minute, <laughs> there's something here. And, and you've kind of picked out Phoenix from the flames and all of that as well, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, with lockdown, it was really scary. I lost 40% uh, of my business disappeared overnight. Some not pleasantly, but the majority, I just knew that clients wouldn't be able to pay me um, because the, mm. the nature of their business, like one ran a hair salon, they weren't going to be able to operate. So I kind of had to roll with the punches and it was very scary, but very quickly within two or three weeks, I thought actually they're going to need people like me. So I, I changed the branding. I also started to do more training, which I kind of nibbled at previously, fitted it in where I could. But this was the time to make it a real staple within the business and not to rely just on retained clients. And that what that led to is that meant that I can be choosy about retained clients. I can say no a lot more because I'm I'm still a portfolio person. But I've got more of, I suppose, more of a product offering, depending where people are on in their are in their business, which I can work out in about fifteen minutes. Um, and so I feel like I've I fit into my clothes of Scott Media a lot better than I did at the start of twenty twenty. Not that I'd ever want to relive any of that again, but <laughs> I think that everything I'd been through in the past prepared me to deal with that scenario. No, I agree. Um, before we move on, another like. Thank you to Sarah Shah. Uh, thank you for for watching and for for liking as well, Thanks, Sarah. But we're yeah, and we're going to now turn our focus from you, Fiona. I've enjoyed it, and you know I could carry on talking about that forever. But I want to move <laughs> on to PR in specific. So we've established that that was really now your focus at this part of your journey. Can I ask an overarching question, or is it an impossible one to answer? What is PR? Okay. Um, yeah, um, you can answer this. There is a sort of definition of it. If you look at the Chartered Institute of PR, you'll, you'll see what it is. But PR is public relations. So in business terms, it's how you deal with the public in every aspect of your business. So in my world, all of marketing is covered by PR and all business owners do PR, even if they don't realize they do it. And um, it is not press relations. That is a tool within the toolbox of PR. It happens to be my speciality, but in isolation on its own, it's not enough. So broadly, it is my T-shirt with my branding on, and I've got to get it right on TV. Okay, that's PR. <laughs> this is PR. Us doing this is PR. Podcasting is PR. Um, your website, your social media, your networking, loads of things make up the whole mix of PR. Everyone has to do it. I think once in 15 years I've met a business owner where I've said mm, PR isn't going to work for you. And that was a business owner who ran a security company where his main contracts were the, with the Ministry of Defence. And um, therefore, he couldn't talk about the work he did with the Ministry of Defence, even though he wanted, yeah. in his case, press coverage. I could not actually deliver that for him because as soon as he saw any kind of press coverage, uh, the Ministry of Defence would be down like a ton of bricks and he'd lose his main client. So that is the only time ever where I've said, no, PR is not going to work for you. It's just as business owners um, or sole traders uh, or even big companies, you have to work out what elements of PR work for you and you flex those elements and you layer them on over time, depending on what growth you do or don't want. Um, so does that answer the question, Chris? Yeah, uh, no, it does. And I mean, I, I knew that it's not necessarily a one size fits all. I mean, like, for example, I love the other another definition that I've heard as well is uh, the practice of managing and disseminating information from an individual or an organization to the public in order to influence their perception. Y you know, that is another way of, of looking at it to some extent as well. It's challenging. And, and I've deliberately wanted to make sure that people kind of uh, appreciate that it is a challenge. And that's where people like you come in. Now, before we come into one of the biggest ones that I learned the hardware is when I first became an entrepreneur or a business owner, 
about what makes a story. There's different forms of PR. You've talked about networking, but you've got written, you've got audio, you've got video. And you need to be aware of all of those and what is appropriate for you. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it is fair. And also the, the thing is to understand that good PR is ever evolving. It will always involve a mix and you need to keep doing it. You just need to keep doing it. It's an, it is it is a beast in any business. Yes. Um, it really is. So there's digital PR too, which is a big thing. And also a, a red flag for me in the world of PR is a company that says it covers every aspect of PR. That is impossible. <laughs> no, I don't create websites. I'll know if you need a website, but I don't create and code websites. We bring in a partner to do that. I don't... Um, I'm not an expert in SEO or pay-per-click. It's not what I enjoy, but I know people who are really good at that. It's about understanding what works for me, how long do I try it to see if it's going to work for me, do I ditch it and try something else, or is that working really well? Um, okay, what's the next thing I can do? What can I layer in next for growth? Um, and generally, the other thing with any type of PR, you have to invest first and grow later almost for everything else in business to be honest you invest in then you grow okay uh, and one other key thing pr is not sales it is not that sales is a different and defined discipline within a business it's aligned to pr but it is not the same an example of how that might work okay i can make you visible say through getting stories in your local media where your business is based and you can get inquiries through your social media, through your website, or on the phone. But if you don't answer the phone or answer those queries in um, a timely manner, that's on you. And that's sales process. And you have to have a sales process. There's no point being really visible if you don't actually follow through with the sales bit, which comes next. Um, so people will often judge elements of PR and say, well, it didn't work, I didn't get any sales. But often when you drill down into why that is, they don't answer their phone. They take three weeks to answer their email. They didn't notice they had those three DMs on LinkedIn. Um, you have to take the next steps as a business owner and see them as two distinct but aligned disciplines. And it's not always linear, I found, which is a very unfair assumption to think that you're able to go, oh, for every one pound you spend, I will bring you two pound back. It doesn't necessarily work, work out linear or not necessarily as obvious, uh, which is harsh. I mean, for example, another form of PR that I, I was aware of is crisis communication. Mm. Yeah. That's no, not sales, I... is it? That... <laughs> no, no, that is... Um a very specific area of PR and I do do it. So all of my retained clients, I will do it for them. And we talk about it. I don't charge extra for that at all, unless something happens so suddenly and out of the blue and cannot be planned for. And I have to drop everything and run. And that will happen two or three times a year. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I'm brought in um, to crisis manage a company. I don't even know. Um, and that is where Business owners often are pretty naive about, one, how the media works, their own responsibility around their behaviour um, when a crisis comes. Um, and my one top tip for something like that, as soon as something happens in your business and you get that feeling or that tickle in your throat or the back of your neck where you think this could go south and it could go south publicly, do something about it then. Because often I am contacted by companies, it's two or three times a year, and I don't know them. The crisis is already happening, and you've got no chance of making that crisis disappear then. You are simply managing a bad situation. And equally, someone like me, I will look at that situation and think, have you behaved ethically in that? Because mm -hmm. if you haven't, I'm not going to help you. Yeah. And I can imagine that's quite a challenging thing for you there. Okay, to be less specific then, I'm going to move on to the question that I've already planted about what makes a story. And I remember in, in my early days, and you've actually added another angle to this when we were chatting before we came on air, is as a business owner, I'm there going, oh, yeah, but this is an amazing story. This is what people want to hear. And there's a lot of times it's like, Chris, no, it's not really a story. It is to you, but it isn't. But equally, you added the flip side of the coin that says, 
I might not realize something is a story that you would identify. Yeah. Um, business owners tend to struggle with this in two ways. Um, they will think that something's a story that isn't. Um, so things like, I've got a new website. I've redone yeah. my logo. I've rebranded. It's not a story unless you are a big player. So um, uh, recently in Swindon, we've had a couple, uh, Nationwide is rebranded. Now, they rebranded a couple of months ago, but there's a story about it in the local paper. But I'm afraid they're not going to run a story about Fiona Scott rebranding. They're just not. No. And in your website, your new website may be very exciting for you, but it's not a story. Um, a story usually will involve people um, and people within a community and what they're doing, i.e. your people. That includes you as a business owner. Um, and for the national press, it usually needs to be timely and topical, issue-led, or the first, the worst, the biggest, the loudest, or you're an A-list celebrity. So when it comes to the media, you have to understand where you fit in what the media wants. And the best way of doing that is to identify maybe your local radio station um, or your local newspaper and have a look through them. What kind of stories are they doing and think, right, oh, I could have fitted in there. So, um, you know, I can run through some quick stories if that's helpful, but um, be mindful of what a story actually is. And also, um, the other thing, right, we, we've just had, it's January, so we've just had the New Year's Honours list. Here's a classic example. Um, and let's just say you get an OBE, Chris. Now, to you, that's a huge deal. You might be really excited about that. And you might assume that's a national news story. I'm just telling you it's not. Because hundreds of people will have got on the New Year's Honours list for this year. And unless you're an A-list celebrity and really, really well known, you're not going to be covered. You're just not going to be covered by the national press. The local press will probably cover that story. But again, that will depend on how many people in Swindon or Wiltshire have got gongs this year, how high profile they are, and generally what happens is you'll just be one of a number of people listed and they will focus on one or two. Um, so it's about managing your expectations around stories um, and thinking, is this a story for the media? Is it a blog post? Is it a social media post? Or is it a combination of all of them? Uh, and isn't there another element here, and I know it's an area that I get involved in, where there's actually paid for articles, say in, in journals or whatever, where y yeah. you it might not be picked up for free by uh, the, you know the media, so to speak, but it could be a paid for article that, that could still get great consumption from it, but you've actually got to pay to put it there. That's just as important for me and for you as a PR person, I would assume. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of snobbery in the world of PR around this. What they'll often talk about is, oh, well, it, well we only deal with earned content. That's BS, folks, when you hear that. It's <laughs> utter BS. One, because journalists don't care about earned content. They just don't. I'm just going to have a drink. Hold on a sec. Yeah, no well, I'll just quickly say, Stephen Scott, thank you for the like and welcome to the show, Stephen. Um, and, you know, <laughs> they don't care about that. But also... Um, we call it advertorial. So um, when you know that a certain publication reaches an audience that's important to you, so this is all aligned to your business goals, and everyone's business goals will be different, but let's just say you are a financial advisor, you're working in the Swindon area, and you really want to stay within the Swindon area, then a local business magazine to you in Swindon is going to be very important. Um, but they are not going to run a story about you every single month or every single week. They're just not going to do it. So putting some money behind that and buying space is actually supporting generally a local business. It mm -hmm. also means you can choose what to put in that space. So it must be legal, tasteful and decent, and it must fit their house style. But it also means you guarantee that you're going to reach that audience on a regular basis. So um, I'm a great advocate of advertorial once I understand a business owner's goals. Um, and in a local area, there aren't going to be that many B2B, business to business magazines or online magazines to choose from. And if that area is really important to your customer base, you want to be seen there a lot. So part of your marketing budget or PR budget 
would be to appear there regularly. And also, apart from anything else, an editor of that kind of publication will always do you a deal. Um, don't accept the rate card. If you commit to 12 or 6 or 3, they'll always do you a deal because they run a small business too. They want to support you. You want to support them. So um, advertorial, to me, is a legitimate tool in the PR toolbox, but it will very much depend on your business and what you want to achieve. And I have to add to it from my perspective is where uh, the likes of yourself in this arena come to light for that is that even for those advertorials, if I wrote it, it would inadvertently, even if I tried to resist it, become salesy, become marketing, become, wow, look at this, isn't this great? Whereas I love the way that you PR gurus will go, no, 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 that's not the wording that we use for this. And it becomes a lot more readable and it doesn't feel like a slap in the face uh you know as a sales message every time the sales message becomes under the surface and you become this dripping tap of a of of an authority on your subject or or whatever it might be those kind of things and that's where your literary genius comes to the aid of business owners like me <laughs> i mean to people who are good at sales copy um, uh, they often find that the way in which I write and other people like me write is very bland. It kind of almost takes the life out of it because we keep it very straight and very factual. But the truth is, do you like at a networking event being sold at by somebody? How does that make you feel? Well, if I'm reading a magazine and um, someone's written half a page where it's just, buy me, I'm great, here are my services, buy me, I've got a special offer on now, you're going to move on pretty quickly. So it's about understanding there's a tone of voice for this type of thing. And it's a drip, drip effect. It's what you want is when someone says to someone, oh, um, you know, I fancy doing a YouTube channel. I want it to look, you know, afford, I want it to be affordable and I want it to look good. And for, you want the other person to say, oh, that Chris, a visual PR, I, yeah, I've come across him. I think he's really, talk to him. You don't want, people don't want to refer to someone who goes in for the hard sell. They just don't. I also think it's a pretty dated way of selling now. Um, it really is. In a modern world, that old target-led sell stuff, it's just old hat. Yes, we have to learn how to sell at the right time. Yeah, and, and people buy from people not, is irrelevant. Yes, yeah. Um, uh, and, so, and, and, uh, yeah. that's that's sorry Fiona that's the key thing there that's with right. uh, with regards to um that you know I see that from you know you save me from a proud business owner waxing lyrical understandably about my business my products my services and and you help us get the word which is I wanted to make sure that was made clear so that everybody didn't go oh but I'm not going to keep coming out with these amazing stories that the press will will will, will swallow up it's like no you don't need to wait for those or hope they come along or try to create them which is always a risky thing to do i think um but it, it is about making sure that the wording's right there for you know whether it's uh you know web copy some of the wording you put on certain pages on your web whether it's blogs whether it's articles in journals what etc 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 is that it pays and getting people like me onto radio and and things like that to to you know be there as a as an expert in the field is is also plays in and and that's that's a key thing here um how do the media perceive though i mean we we really kind of largely touched on it so we probably don't need to spend too much time but the media perceive those small businesses and their stories are they a nuisance or are they looking for more people to come forward with stories um funny you should ask that um the media generally, local reporters and national reporters, they want to hear from small business owners. But the key thing is hearing from them at the right time when they need them, not being hassled by them and hounded by them every five minutes or getting angry because a journalist, a national journalist will get on average a thousand to two thousand emails into their email box every single day. It's impossible wow. to manage. So they will skim read them and they will look for the stuff they're writing about now. So you've got to think of it as building a rapport. And it's the same with local journalists. Build a relationship so that you're in their little black book, so that when they're writing a story about, I don't know what it is, if you're an accountant, they're writing a story about the budget in March. And they think, oh, I'll speak to that person. 
um, that accountant I spoke to last time, so they pick up the phone to you. Um, you have to fit, a journalist, you have to fit into their agenda, not them fit into yours, because they never will. If you try to do that, you're like knitting fog. They aren't there to advertise your business. They're there to tell stories and to fill the space, whatever space they've got to fill, whether it's a radio show, a TV show, or whether it's in a newspaper or a magazine. You have to fit their agenda, not the other way around. And if you don't like that, then maybe press relations is not a palm part of PR for you. Do something else. Um, because they are not going to fit what you think is a story. They will decide what a story is. Agreed. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, before I wrap up with just sort of making sure everybody's aware what Scott Media does, I'm allowed to say that because I'm not Scott Media, so I'm allowed to uh, uh, wax lyrical as the final part on it. But is there anything that I've left out that you think will be useful to share on the PR side of things? Um, I would just say... Um... If you've never done PR before, get a bit of training and try it yourself and see how you get on. Because the best clients for someone like me is someone who's done it. They understood what is required and they're actually now time poor and they want to pass it on to someone who's good. Mm -hmm. um, and many good PR companies will tell you this. So um, try it yourself. Understand what it is. Understand what works for you. Ditch what doesn't work for you. Um, but you've got to give it time. That's the other thing. You've got to be in it for the long game. Almost any aspect of PR, whether it's networking, whether it's your website, whether it's paid for ads, it takes six to 12 months for anything to feel different. Okay. And that's what happens first. It feels different usually. You might get lucky and get one or two direct sales really early on. But the reality is that is the exception and not the rule. So if you, PR is about a long game. So get yourself to a certain size, train yourself, be a bit educated so you don't waste money. And then when you are ready, commit to outsourcing or training someone within your team. And that could be with me or many other people who are good. Um, I guess the red flags about what good looks like and what bad looks like is probably a story for another day. <laughs> yeah that's a whole other episode i can imagine right there but uh, uh i i live by i've always lived by a mantra in sales and marketing of if you don't tell you can't sell and uh because you, you you know you're not shooting that sniper rifle at the point when they've got the need they don't but equally they might not know there's a solution to a problem that hasn't occurred yet whereas if you make sure that they are aware that you exist aware of what you can do and help and provide etc if or when that issue arrives further down the line you want them to be able to go oh that company i read all about that i saw all about that i heard all about that whatever it might be that's the point you keep going get people making you, uh, you aware or if it's not them directly someone else read about you or heard about you or etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's what resonates uh, massively for me i'd never really thought about it in terms of learning uh because i've just gone for the outsource and you've kind of probably woken me up a little bit there which is uh, is quite good which does neatly lead me on to the wrap up on this part is that as well as you doing the do it for you stuff you also do the the pr coaching you also do podcast coaching as well now is 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 a big thing um, is it plural or singular book or books i can't remember now it's one book one book came out uh, back end of last year about my uh, my 10 years in business and the multiple and many mistakes I made along the way um, and all the joyous things that happened too. And what was that called? It's called The Hard Yards and you can find all details about it on my website, which is on screen. Um, and it's on that big place, that big bookshop in the sky as well. You can find it there too. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. And the thing I love about it is a real family book. So the font is Georgia. My daughter's called Georgia. Um, the front cover's designed by my older daughter, Sammy, Samantha. And the um, the names of Steve, David, uh, Lauren, and my grandson, Oliver, are all hidden on the uh, front cover. So I wonder if oh, you wow. can find them. I do love that. So that's the hard yards. And that's by Fiona Scott. You haven't gone with like a pseudonym or anything. Yeah. You're not guys. No, no, it's, by, uh, it's, it's <laughs> no, it's by Fiona Scott, and it was done in partnership um, with my publisher called Turquoise Tiger. So um, both our logos are on it, 
and um, back end of this year, I'll start on my second book. Uh, lovely comment coming in. Vanessa White says, thank you for a really informative video. I look forward to episode two. Thank you, Vanessa. Lovely comment. Aww. Thank you, Vanessa. That's really lovely. Thank you. And before I, I really properly finish with it being about episode two, the final one, I don't know whether you're able to talk about this just yet. The speakers thing, are you talking about that yet or not yet? Uh, yeah, no, no, I can speak about it, though um, not all of my clients know about it. I am starting probably February, March, not quite sure of the start date, but I'll talk about it more. I'm adding a speakers bureau, if you like, onto Scott Media, which is a value add for clients. Um, I'm hitting that niche of speakers. Um, uh, that cost you a thousand pounds or less uh, to allow people to grow and develop their speaking. All of my clients will get access to it for free, um, but anyone else will have to pay a small amount. And it's really to bring public speaking into the PR arena more fully. I do a lot of public speaking. You do speaking, Chris. I don't train people to do public speaking. I have many partners that do that, but it's just showcasing them and um, getting them to understand that there's a journey with speaking. There is a time to be paid and there's a time not to be paid. And equally for those people who try to speak speakers, there's a time to pay and there's a time not to pay. And um, I hope Scott Media Speakers will be live very, very soon. And uh, I'll explain more about how it works in due course. Nice little teaser there on that one. Talking about a teaser, episode two, Roughly speaking, beginning of February, early February, maybe Friday the 2nd, but we'll confirm that in due course. And potentially a pretty cool guest as well. Yeah. Anyone who has been around me and my clients know that in October this year, I went to Las Vegas um, to attend a tech conference. Um, I was representing SME today and it, it was an amazing experience and I shared a lot of details about it. But I met this really cool journalist called John Boytnot, who's based in San Francisco. When I was there, we basically uh, sat in the media room for three days when we went out doing interviews and attending talks and got to know each other. And I've asked him to come and be a guest and share with us some of his journey in journalism based in San Francisco, his interests, how we might interact with him given he's on a, a sort of an, a, over in America and how he might be able to help my clients and anyone watching. Um, and I've just got to hook up with John um, to, to see if he can come on. I know he wants to because I've already asked him. And just a bit about his life. I, you know, I'm horribly nosy. I want to know what his life is like in San Francisco and where he travels. It's a whole different ball game working in America to here, a whole different media landscape. So I want to find out a bit about that. So I hope it will interest others as well. Exactly. So make sure you jump onto, in particular, the YouTube channel, because you can subscribe to the channel. You can, we will schedule the show a good week or so before we plan to go live. And you can hit the uh, notify. You, if it's on Facebook, it's as an event. So you can click that you're going. And please do invite others as well, because this is going to grow and it's all designed to be really helpful for as many of you as possible. And for me, it's an absolute treat to be able to bring uh, Fiona mm -hmm. and her knowledge to the screen. Uh, and, and visual PR working in partnership with uh, with Fiona and Scott Media is is just an absolute treat for me that I I'm, I'm feel very privileged to be able to do. And that's what really today has felt like, Fiona. I know that it wasn't necessarily uh, where you intend to take this uh, in the whole, but I said that I really wanted to, to get to the bottom of you and, and your journey in it and PR as a whole. And I hope you feel that we've, uh, we've done that because I certainly do. It's been so much fun. Oh, thank you ever so much. Yeah, I, I, well, let's be honest. If we're really honest, we don't mind talking about ourselves sometimes, do we? And in business, <laughs> we've got to get, we've got to get comfortable with that. We've got to get comfortable yep. with that because people won't buy from us if they don't know about us. Um, but also, if you're watching this on replay, don't be afraid to comment. Um, you know, between us, we'll try and uh, respond to comments in the meantime. We're pretty good at that. Um, because I've learned that loads of people want to watch things in their own time and that's fine. And uh, it's been fun. And, it, you know, all of business should have an element of fun. This is fun. It's fun for me. I hope it's fun for the guests. And I hope it's fun for people listening in whenever they listen in, whether it's live or on replay. Exactly. And, and it's worth throwing in as well. If anybody's got uh, suggestions or requests for future episode content or and or guests, 
you know, let Fiona know, let me know, whatever, um, and it will be put into the melting pot uh, because we're going for certainly at least twelve months that we're we're rocking with this real PR with Fiona Scott, and uh, and and I l enjoy that. I think that brings us to a close, Fiona. Yeah, I think it is. I think that's our January episode wrapped up. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. I've loved it, and um, here's to the February one. Here's to it indeed. I'm going to play us out with the outro. Fiona, I'm going to put us to the back, but don't go anywhere because I need you to stay there so that it uploads everything. We'll speak off air in a moment. Uh, but for everybody watching, thank you, Fiona. It's been a treat. You're the host on the next one, aren't you? So uh, we look forward to seeing that one happening. Cheers.